Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel and follow my Facebook page. Please also support my work on Patreon and Kickstarter. It will be greatly appreciated. All right, thank you for coming. And what we are doing today is we are going to do um, the thoracic wall and lymph node stations. Um, you've, uh, you've got the checklist of the thoracic wall with you and uh, you can open that up and we will go through those. Uh, I haven't had, I don't have that opened up, but I don't think I will. Um, because, uh, let me see, let me see. I might as well open that up too, actually. I think that's the one. Yep, that's the one. And uh, let me just start with a 2D viewer. And here we are. And uh, we will start, uh, we'll go through the thoracic wall. Now, this is up at the next station. I will use the bone um, contrast. And here we are. Now, we first, let's start with the thoracic vertebrae. So, first of all, let's actually see where we are. So this is high up in the neck. Now, I'll go all the way up until it spins to the other side. This is high up in the neck. This is a cervical vertebra. The, the reason you know it is because you've got um, uh, transverse foramen in it. If you keep scrolling downwards, you will notice another vertebra come through, and you will notice that there is a rib associated with that vertebra. So when you see a rib associated with that vertebra, and it's the first vertebra that you come across, that is T1. Uh, then that's the first rib. Another thing you will notice at this level is the clavicle. And so we will also do the clavicle in this session. But first, we'll, we will just sort of go through the basic vertebra, and that's, uh, and, that's, and that's T1. Now, T1 isn't a typical thoracic vertebra, so I'll take you down to about, oh, let's count them, actually. So that's T1. That's T2. That's T3, that's T4, that's T5, and let's take you down to T6. All right, that's T6. And um, and there's your, uh, uh, that's the T6 thoracic vertebra. And let's just look at the vertebra itself. So the vertebra, that's the body of the vertebra. If we got to a sort of a position here you can see the whole um, a vertebral foramen, which is where the spinal cord sits, and that you, even if you scroll up and down, that structure will remain in that area. Um, at this level, you can sort of see the vertebra, and you can see the transverse processes on both sides. And if you scroll slightly in a different plane, which I went to the other vertebra, you will see the spinous process also going through this whole whole area. So those are the basic things about the vertebra. But whenever you look at the vertebra, the best uh, the best actual view is the sagittal view. And let me just wait for that to come through. And that is the sagittal view right here. And um, and if and if you look at the sagittal view, what you are is it mid sagittal? Is it not mid sagittal? You know, you can move to one end and you can move to the other end. So how do you know if it's mid sagittal or not mid sagittal? Well, for one thing, you can look at the trachea. You can sort of see it go through. Now, trachea is not perfectly in the midline, but it is. But another thing that's important is like you can see the whole um, uh, space for the spinal cord, all the vertebral form foramens here. Now, if I moved it to one end, you'll see like you know you can see the pedestals. Uh, and so they, um, they're not right in the midline. So you sort of try to get in the midline. You get a nice view of the spinous processes also in the midline. Uh, so when you've got it in the midline, what you're really looking for is you're looking for the nice kyphotic shape. You know, the thoracic vertebra is in, the, is in a kyphosis, so you want to see that You want to see that angle. You want to see that angle is smooth on the inside of the vertebral uh, column and on the outside of the vertebral column. And this is where there are two very important ligaments. The anterior spinal ligament is right here, and the posterior spinal ligament is right here. So this is the anterior and posterior spinal ligaments right here next to each other. And when you look at the nice smooth surface at the back and you, and you, and you look at it all the way going down, you've got the ligamentum flavum that is on this side. So ligamentum flavum is over here. 
and the ligamentum flavum also gives a nice curve to it. Um, and, uh, and that's also the curve that you want to see. You want to see that the curve is actually nice, uh, kyphotic, and is not, uh, you don't see any disruption in the curves. And you'll see those things. I'll, I'll show you in a couple of other um, uh, quizzes that you know you have those, you have those things placed in that area. And uh, another thing that you want to look at, you want you want to look at all the sort of um, uh, the 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 body, the, all the borders of the body of the vertebral body, and you want to make sure that they're nice and smooth. I know in some places they they look like there's a fracture, and that and at times it might it might it's difficult to uh, differentiate between a fracture and a non-fracture. Um, big fractures are very obvious, but small fractures can, can be difficult to see. But this is generally normal that you see in these areas. So you want to three, three, see the borders. Um, and if you were having a detailed look, you'll, through, you'll see all the borders through uh, across the different planes. Um, another thing that you want to see are the spaces, uh, intervertible spaces. And the intervertible spaces need to be nice and even. Um, and that shows you the quality of the intervertible disc also. Now, while we are at this level, another thing that we can look to is what is, which one is T1 and where is T1 and how do we count from T1 to T12? So if I scroll to one end, you will sort of see a rib emerge and, that, and, the, and the ribs will start emerging. So which one of these is the first rib? So that's the clavicle. That's the first rib. 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th, and 12th. So these are the 12 ribs. Um, and so, if you scroll back and you follow the first rib, it will lead to a vertebral body, and that is, that is T1. T2, T3, T4, T5, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th. And T12, if you move to the side, you will see that that is going to show you the 12th rib. When we move to the side, before the ribs, um, as the ribs emerge, you see another, you know, sort of bright structure here. You're going to see this around the ribs also. So what is this bright structure? You see it around all the ribs. So these are the transverse processes. So these are all the transverse processes of the vertebra. And if you keep following the transverse processes, they'll take you to another important aspect of the vertebra, and which is the facet joint. So these are your facet joints. So the facet joints are important because these are the joints the vertebra has with the vertebra above and the vertebra below it. So the facet, facet joints, there are four facet joints, uh, two superior facet joints and two inferior facet joints. So every vertebra, uh, so here you can see one superior, one inferior. Uh, but if I scroll to the other plane, uh, keep scrolling through and go to the other side, you will see the other. So there's one superior, one inferior here also. So if you're actually looking through all the vertebral column and uh, assessing for trauma to the back or severe back pain, then you will be viewing the facet joints also to make sure that everything over there seems to be in place. Um, between these facet joints, these are the intervertebral foramen. That's where the spinal nerves come through. So these are the intervertebral foramen through which the spinal nerves come through. And uh, that's about, I think, all that we have to really look for over here. Absolutely. Um, now I'm, uh, I'll take you back to the transverse view. Now, if you have any questions, just feel free to pop in and, uh, and ask. Okay, so let's go up. Let's say I believe that, you know, let's go somewhere mid in the chair. So let's say this one. Um, now let's discuss the ribs. Now, now, if you look at the ribs, the ribs have a joint with uh, the vertebral body. And that is the costal vertebral joint. The ribs also have a joint with the transverse process. Over here, you should be able to see it on both sides. There you go. There's the other one. And that is the costal transverse joint. So you have to see the costal vertebral joint, the costal transverse joint, and then you can follow the rib. Now this is the shaft of the rib. You can follow it all the way through until it goes to the other end. And then you'll miss it here because it will join a costal cartilage. You see now that's another joint. That's a joint, that's a, that's a costal chondral joint. That's the joint the, uh, the rib has uh, with the uh, with the, um, uh, uh, costal cartilages here, 
Uh, and then you can't see it further, but the costal cartilages, if you look here, they all come together. These are the costal cartilages that will come together and join the xiphoid process of the sternum here. So if you looked at a higher rib, let's look at this rib. So this rib, actually, I'm not sure, it could be rib three or four. Now, this rib also, you're going to see um, uh, the, the costal verte vertebral joint here. Then there's the costal transverse joint here. Then you will follow the shaft. If you go all the way to the other end, you follow the shaft, and then you're going to see a costochondral joint. That's the costochondral joint, the joint that the rib has uh, with the, uh, with the uh, costal cartilages. And then the costal cartilages will go on and attach to the sternum, which you can't see very clearly here, but that's essentially the all this is costal cartilage that is attaching to the sternum. So that's how um, the rib is viewed. And uh, another way to view this is um, especially, let's do, let's do the sternum. And when we do the sternum, we'll come back and do a couple of things. Now the sternum, one of the best ways to look at the sternum is here, again, the sagittal uh, view. And when you look at the sternum, that's the manubrium of the sternum. That's the sternal angle or the angle of Louis. That's the body of the sternum. And the xiphoid process may be here, maybe there. It's actually not very clearly demarcated here. That could be the xiphoid process, and that is probably just calcification in the costal cartilages. Uh, so that's one way to view the sternum, which is a nice way. But if, you, if, I'm, if I move laterally, um, you, see, you see these? These are actually ribs. Um, sorry, not the ribs. Uh, these, this is actually the sternum. These are the joints. In between these bony parts, are actually the joints are the costal cartilage joints and then they become these are the costal cartilages that you see here and then if you keep following them they will join a rib if you keep following them on the side you see they, they will join a rib and these are all the ribs the costal cartilages here are going to back there you go and so those ribs will come through here so if you go through to the other end that's what it or what it sort of looks like now that we are at this level, let me just show you another joint here now. As a matter of fact, let's go. Let's see the rib here. Let's find the rib here. As a matter of fact, let's go up here. Uh, funny ideas every time. What rib attaches to the uh, sternal angle? Any idea? What rib would attach there? It is the second rib. Yeah, it's the second rib. So that should be the second rib. If the second rib, you keep following the second rib, and absolutely there it is. That is the second rib. And let's, and, and let's keep following the second rib further in, and then you're going to see that's the first rib. So you got that right. Keep following the second rib. And what joint is that? Now that is your costal transverse joint, because that's your transverse process. And if you keep going through it, it, you, you will come to the other end and it will join the body there and another way to look at this is actually in the coronal view and the coronal view is actually quite nice also so there you've got all the ribs so let's move posteriorly oh that's anteriorly uh, posteriorly and so this is the vertebral column a second so let's just look at the these are the vertebral bodies so what are these things here as I move you'll see those say these ones you will not see them in your lumbar vertebra let me show you the lumbar vertebra oh I can't get a good image see the lumbar vertebra you do not see those pointy things with the lumbar vertebra but when I come up here in the thoracic vertebra they're right there there they are so these are the this this actually let me just that one is a is a costal vertebral joint that is based that's a rib that's a rib attaching to the vertebra and if i follow that rib further back you will see the costal transverse joint which is right here and then you can follow that rib through and then it will become a shaft and then you will follow it this way and then this is a rib laterally and what do you see inferiorly here? That's the costal groove. 
that is where your intercostal artery vein uh, and nerve are so that's the costal groove and you can keep following it forward keep following it forward and whoops went too far because this is the apple mouse just doesn't stop keep following it forward and there see at that level that is where your cost costochondral joint is and that costochondral joint will you can see the costal cartilage then will go and attach to the xiphoid process and, uh, and that's that Another cool thing to see, and that is in the transverse frame, is if you come up here, and let's go back to the first rib. That's the first rib. That's the second rib. Let's follow the second rib again, because the second rib attaches at a very interesting part, as we just discussed. That's your costochondral cartilage, and if you follow this, this is going to attach here at a point where it just sort of vanishes. So what is this part? So let's go superiorly first. So this is, let's keep going superiorly. And so the sternum just ended there. That is actually the clavicle. That is a superior aspect of the clavicle. So the clavicle, that's the sternoclavicular joint up here. And so the sternum will show up. So that's the maneuver. That's, that right here is a sternal notch. Like that's the sternal notch. That's, that's the sternal notch. So that's the maneuver. As we keep going down, and as the manubrium actually kind of vanishes, this area, that is actually your angle of Louis. And so that is the sternal angle. And radiologically, they always ask these questions, like at the sternal angle, what events happen at the sternal angle? And here, you know, you can see the ascending aorta, the descending aorta, the arch of the aorta is at the sternal angle. Um, you can see the pulmonary trunk developing at the sternal angle, and the pulmonary arteries uh, uh, dividing at the sternal angle. Uh, you can see the carina uh, at the sternal angle. This is your um, uh, trachea that's dividing. You, you got that at the sternal angle. So uh, that's a, that's an interesting part in anatomy that that you can see here with the sternal angle. So that's um, that that's I think that's all we've got to do with the rib. Any questions? Now, in your notes, I don't have the clavicle, and I'm sorry, I forgot to mention it, uh, but the clavicle is an important bone in the thoracic cavity, so might as well discuss the clavicle also. So there's your clavicle right here, and posteriorly, it's, it starts here, so we'll discuss these bones also, so don't, don't, don't worry about that, but we will do those. But this is the, how it, it's, it, that's posterior, that's, most, that's the most superior aspect of the clavicle. You can see it move forward in an S shape, and then it attaches there to the maneuverium and that's your uh, and that's how the clavicle uh, is is viewed and again on this side moving posteriorly posteriorly is the most superior aspect and as we move inferiorly it will go and attach onto the maneuverium of the sternum and that's all we had to do about the clavicle now the next one is the scapula so a good way to view the scapula is to move completely and freely. So let's go and see the diaphragm now. First, let's get to the diaphragm. Here we are, fully in the diaphragm, in the liver, in the abdomen. Um, and let's move up superiorly now. And while we move up superiorly, keep an eye out here, over here. So as I move up superiorly, keep an eye out here. The, the, the scapula will pop up here. There it is. And that is the um, inferior angle of the scapula. That's the inferior aspect of the scapula. There should be one there too, but you know, some uh, scapula is not always even. So if you keep moving superiorly, there's going to be one that pops up here also. So that is your inferior angle of the scapula. Now, as the inferior angle develops, then you've got your uh, lateral border and your medial border. So that's your lateral border, that's your medial border. So uh, let's view it in this side. So back to the angle, inferior angle of the scapula lateral and medial border as you keep moving upward and then as you keep getting more higher and higher scapula becomes wider and broader and then the spine presents itself and that's the spine of the scapula now keep in mind that this person has their arms outstretched 
upward. So the scapula is medially rotated. So the spine is also sort of medially rotated. And so the superior aspect of the scapula is actually moved laterally and the inferior aspect, sorry, moved medially. And the inferior aspect is sort of moved up out here. So if this is the scapula, and uh, so that's, if you saw the inferior angle, that's the lateral border, that's the medial border. Um, then we've got some spaces in the scapula here. So this area, this, this portion, that's more anterior and facing to the chest. This is the subscapular fossa. This is the subscapular area, the subscapularis muscle is also. Then if you look at the spine, then there's an area above the spine. So that's the supraspinous fossa. And so it should be above, but as I said, the scapula is medially rotated. It is actually moved medially. So this is um, uh, the suprascapular fossa. And inferior to the spine is the infra, so supraspinous fossa, sorry. And this is the infraspinous fossa over here, where the infraspinatus anterior is major and minor L. So, um, so that's the uh, sort of middle aspect of the scapula. So they keep moving superiorly. Keep moving superiorly. So now the scapula, there's a funny thing that's developing here. Let's 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 focus on that before we focus here. So if you look here, then it will form into the glenoid cavity where the head of the humerus emerges. So that's your glenoid labrum. And if you keep following it this way as we move superiorly, this process of the scapula is the coracoid process. So that's the coracoid process. Yes, that's the glenoid labrum. And uh, and let's, let's go keep on moving and fairly back to this angle. Now let's keep an eye on the spine of the scapula. And the spine of the scapula actually moves superiorly and becomes the acromion process. Oops, going too far. It becomes the acromion process. And as you can see here, the acromion process is uh, closely associated with the head of the humerus, although it's, it's part of the shoulder joint. Uh, and the acromion process also is uh, articulates with the clavicle. So that's your acromion process, that's the head of the humerus, and that's the clavicle. And that's how you see those structures um, in the transverse view. And the transverse view is generally the more important view. The scapula is not really well seen in the sagittal, um, uh, in the sagittal view. You're going to have to... You'll have to move it to an end. There you go. There's a scapula. It shows up. You can see the spine. Oops, sorry. You can see the spine and the glenoid labrum. But it's a bit hard. It's a bit hard to appreciate all the different parts of the scapula in this way. Although you can see it. Um, and in the coronal view, it's even worse actually. Because let's move. Let's keep moving. Uh, let's move the other way. And there you go. There's this. There's a scapula. See, it sort of presents itself here. You can see the glenoid labrum there also. And uh, if you keep moving posteriorly, it's not it's not too well. So the spine you can see fairly well, but it doesn't sort of. It's a bit hard to appreciate its anatomy in this, in these sort of views. The best view is the transverse view, or the axial view. All right. Any any questions about that? So how are you guys hold? I'm sorry. Okay. So how are you guys holding up? Are you happy to go through the the muscles of the thoracic wall? All right, Julian. Yeah. Okay, you're with us too. All right, that's great. Okay. So the muscles of the thoracic wall. The first one that we've got are the ex are the intercostals. Now the intercostals are external, internal, and innermost intercostals. And if you Google them, their CT scans, they, they tend to say that you can sort of sometimes differentiate the three, but I find it very hard, even if I magnify to a large amount. The, the intercostal muscles are right here between the ribs. So this is where the intercostal muscles are. So even if I magnify, uh, it is fairly hard to see the different like layers of the intercostal muscles. You can, it's very hard to see. I, I, I can't actually tell the difference. But between the intercostal spaces, that's where the intercostal muscles are. So that's where the intercostal muscles are going to be. Maybe at certain points you can sort of see the demarcation, but usually it's high. I find it hard to see. Uh, and so that's where the intercostal muscles are. 
So the external are outermost, and it's internal, and then the innermost is the innermost layer. And then you've got your visceral, uh, sorry, you've got your parietal pleura, and then you've got your visceral pleura, all of that in this one little thin line. So it's actually very, very small space. Um, then the two muscles I've written down, subcostalis and, and transversus uh, thoracis. Now these muscles, they're, they're here in the anterior aspect. Well, let me zoom out a bit. Um, transversus thoracis is the muscle that goes across from the costal cartilages to the medial border of the sternum. And the subcostalis is a, is a muscle that comes from the costal cartilages, moves in fairly and attaches to other costal cartilages. Um, they are in this area. They can't truly be demarcated clearly. Um, and so um, you can't see them exactly, but they are in this area. The other thing that we've done previously, those are the internal thoracic vessels that are right here. So that's, that's that for the intercostals. Okay, then we come to the major muscles of the external chest wall, and that's pectoralis major and pectoralis minor. Uh, if you are looking for pectoralis major and minor, this is the right place to look. Now, this is a CT scan of a female, so there's breast tissue here. So that is not pectoralis major or minor, but deeper to that is, is where you're looking. And that is where pec major and pec minor should be. Um, and so uh, let me get you to a plane where you can sort of differentiate them with a, a bit of a, you know, as you go up higher up in the neck, they become a bit more thicker. And so that muscle outside is pec major. The muscle inside is pec minor. Let's do pec major first. So if you, if you can recall the attachments of the pec major, the pec major is attached to the clavicle. It's attached to the sternum. There we go. And if you keep going lower down, it actually attaches to the uh, uh, to the ribs as well, into the costal cartilages. So, but if you move it upward, if you move it superiorly, it actually attaches to the medial aspect of the humerus. Now, this person has their arm up in the air. So let's follow this muscle back up superiorly, and let's see if it does go up to the humerus. And here we go, we're still following this, now it's becoming this nice big belly here. Let's keep following it, and it's become this big belly. And here we've got the humerus, and there you can see the pec major. Uh, it goes, it, it doesn't go high enough to its attachment point, but there's the pec major, uh, and there's the uh, medial aspect of the humerus. So that's the pec major. If I move back down, you should be able to see this belly spread across the anterior chest wall attached to the clavicle and to the manubrium and then sternum and spread across to the anterior chest wall. And that's your pec major. Pretty neat. Is that sort of clear? Okay, now pec... Well, that's, I'm glad. Now pec minor is a smaller, is a smaller muscle. Um, and and um, uh, it doesn't attach too... Go, goes, it doesn't go too far down. It attaches to the superior ribs. And then if you and if you follow this bar, uh, the the muscle belly, it should come and if and when you keep going superiorly, it should go and attach to the coracoid process of the scapula, and that's the coracoid process of the scapula. And sort of at this level, if you follow this muscle belly, you will see that this becomes the pec minor. There you go, that's the pec minor. Keeps coming here. And, and you will see it come and attach to the coracoid. Oops, just vanished there, but that there it attaches to the coracoid process. All right, there's the pec minor. Any questions about that? Now, serratus anterior. Now, where's serratus anterior? Serratus anterior. Okay, well, well, let's let's do pec major and minor on the other side. That's pec major on the other side. Let's trace it up to the humerus. There we go. That's pec major traced up to the humerus. Oops. Now we've gone to this. That's pec major. Let's trace it back down. All the way there. Yep. And pec minor is this muscle over here. And you can trace it up to the, oops, there it went, up to the coracoid, there it is, up to the coracoid process. And there's your pec minor. And uh, now that we're there, I'll take you a bit more inferiorly. 
and you're going to see a muscle arise. Yes, I see at this level. This is if you come in closer to the diaphragm. Let's let's say close to the diaphragm. That's pretty good. What's this muscle? You see now these are the intercostals, but there's a muscle outside. That is the serratus anterior. And if you follow this muscle upward, the serratus anterior actually comes and attaches. In, in the anterior, in the subscapular fossa, in the anterior aspect of the scapula, and it attaches to the medial border of the subscapular fossa. So that's your serratus anterior. You see it coming back, and you'll see it come attached here. And the muscle here, the medial border of the scapula, is the serratus anterior. And so this is the serratus anterior attachment. When I go higher up, it'll sort of, yeah, there you can sort of see a bit of demar. No, I think that's a shadow. But this is. It's called too high up. This is where the serratus anterior lives and the subscapularis lives further up here. So this is where serratus anterior is and that muscle belly actually continues down and this area, this is that's pretty much the serratus anterior. This over here. Same thing on the other side. You can see that's the serratus anterior. You can trace it back to the medial aspect of the subscapular fossa. So the serratus anterior essentially attaches this aspect of the scapula with the thoracic wall. All right. Are you still following? Good old, good old. Um, now let's, let's look at the latissimus dorsi. Uh, the latissimus dorsi is this big fan-shaped muscle. Now let me take you down inferiorly again. Look at this muscle here. Now the latissimus dorsi inferiorly attaches um, to the midline uh, in the back. And it's a fan-shaped muscle. And if I keep following this, it actually keeps going up and attaches to the humerus. Again, in a sort of medial aspect. Uh, next to the pectoralis major tendon. So we've done the pectoralis major tendon. Now if you follow this muscle, this just, and superiorly, it should take us up to the humerus uh, near the pectoralis major tendon. So let's go and let's keep following this muscle. Let's see, look, there you go. The scapula will sort of emerge here and this still covers, out, this muscle is still outside the scapula, uh, external to it, and then you see that muscle uh, belly over there. You keep going up. The muscle belly is now becoming much thicker. And you don't see it fanning out there much anymore. Now this has sort of become the muscle belly. And if you keep following this muscle belly, and it'll kick, take you all the way up to the humerus, right next to the pectoralis major. And that's its attachment. So that is the latissimus dorsi. Its attachment is right there. And let's follow it again. Let's follow it again downwards. That's the muscle belly. Let's keep taking it down. Let's keep taking it down. And there it goes. This is big muscle belly near the scapular region. And then it starts fanning out, as you can see here. And it fans out all the way to the side. Like that. And if you look at the one on this side, again, let's move, make it move superiorly upward. And here you can see it attach to the humerus. Right there. And that's your latissimus dorsi. So have you ever heard of the statement, the, the lady between two majors? So there's pec major, there's latissimus dorsi, and there's teres major. So the lady between two majors, I guess they call it the latissimus dorsi, probably because it sounds like the lady to whoever it was. But um, that's pec major, that's latissimus dorsi, so that is teres major. So where does teres major attach in, on, on its uh, uh, distal attachment? And teres major attaches uh, to the angle of the scapula. And let's just follow that muscle again. And let's take it down. It becomes a bit broader here. 
let's keep following it down there it is there it is and that that there is the body of the series measure So Tyr's major is is essentially on this over here. If from here, if you follow it up, it will go and join into the humerus right there, and that's the Tyr's major. If you want to see it on the other side, that's the Tyr's major. If you follow it down there, 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 and you will see it join on to the medial border of the scapula. Sorry, the lateral border of the scapula. And so it comes from the lateral border of the scapula and attaches to the humerus. And that was a teres major there. And, and then we've got the rhomboids. Oh, I missed the trapezius. I always do that. Okay, let's go up into the neck. And up in the neck, we're going to see a big muscle belly develop here that one and that is the trapezius as it spreads sideways it attaches to the clavicle it attaches to the acromion process and it co continues downward and then continues to attach but becomes thinner uh, and continues downward and attaches uh, to the scapula and to the to the spinous processes here all further further down so you can't really see it too well here but it is there. It's a thin muscle that's right over here. And in the same way, if you want to see the rhomboids, the rhomboids are actually attached to the lateral border here of the scapula. And they go and they attach to the midline. So they are deeper to the trapezius. So the muscle belly, they're not in the intercostal spaces. So here, uh, it's uh, you can see it here and that's the rhomboids that's the rhomboids and th that will keep coming through and it will go and it is attaching to the midline so that's the rhomboids the trapezius is is more outward outside more external and more superficial than the rhomboids so they don't go that far so this area out here is trapezius and deeper are the rhomboids And then the erector spiny muscle. Now, erector spiny is a group of four to five different muscles, but they always they are living in this area. So they live around the transverse and the spinous processes, and they live in this area. So these on both sides are the erector spiny muscles. And you also have okay, and we and now we're at the rotator cuff. Um, what we've got at the rotator cuff is. Uh, We've got subscapular fossa. Uh, so, so what are the subscapular uh, muscles? If you remember, uh, we did one, which was a serratus anterior, and then the other one is a subscapularis. So this is the subscapularis over here. I'm outlining that border, and this is the serratus anterior over here. On the other side. Uh, this is the infraspinous uh, fossa. So on the infraspinous fossa is the infraspinatus. So that's the infraspinatus. The teres minor is also here, but you can't really demarcate it. But if you look at this one, that is the teres major. So that's the teres major. The teres minor should be here. You can't demarcate it clearly. And that, and that is the infraspinatus there. And above this is the supraspinatus, because it's the supraspinous process. Sorry, supraspinous fossa. And that is the supraspinatus. And that covers all the bones and muscles. All right, the lymph node stations, and that's next. And so lymph node stations become very important for uh, radiologists especially because they have to uh, look through CT scans to make sure they can find all the relevant lymph nodes um, and, uh, and, and make sure that they can report on them. So I might as well ask you this, there's a, there's a proper way of uh, classifying lymph nodes radiologically, which radiologists learn, 
because they have to report them so you know if this is left is this right is this up or this up. so they're, they're very particular about it i haven't been that particular because i don't think it's necessary for people who are not radiologists but if you want a very particular one in which all these boundaries are defined do let me know Yeah, so yeah, those lymph node groups will not be relevant for you guys. All right, so one big lymph node group that you've heard about is the supraclavicular. So first thing is, where is the clavicle? And there's the clavicle on both sides. So the supraclavicular lymph nodes are actually in here. That, that may as well be a supraclavicular lymph node, that and that. And the supraclavicular lymph nodes can be anywhere on top of the border, around the border of the, of the clavicle and just under it, or behind the sternum. Now, there's another lymph node group here that's, I've, that I've labeled sternal. Now, sternal and supraclavicular sometimes uh, are interchanged, and sometimes they, and they name them separately, but sometimes they name them at the, uh, uh, together. And so there's a sternal, so the lymph node, sternal lymph node groups are here, and a supra, um, and, and if you join them together, the supraclavicular are around the clavicle here and both sides and, and behind the sternum right there. So that's where the sternal and supraclavicular lymph nodes are. The lower cervical lymph nodes are actually higher up because of the lower cervical lymph nodes. So they're higher up, so they're around the vertebral column. So you've got lymph nodes, uh, if you did the cardiac one, that is the internal jugular vein. So around the internal jugular vein, there are, there are lymph node groups. And, and that's the external jugular vein on both sides. And so around the internal and external jugular veins, you've got you know lower cervical lymph nodes. And some call the ones around the external jugular vein the superficial, and the ones around the um, internal jugular vein deep. Uh, radiologists will use different terms for that, but this is where the uh, lower cervical lymph nodes are. And then we move on to the supraclavicular ones. So there we go. Uh, following so far? Now the auxiliary lymph nodes. Where would the auxiliary lymph nodes be? Where is the axilla? So the auxiliary lymph nodes are exactly in this area, these two areas. So that's where the auxiliary lymphadenopathy shows up. You can see the auxiliary blood vessels. You can see those. You see them follow them through and here they become the subclavian vessels. So this is the area where the auxiliary lymph nodes are. Same here, you can see the auxiliary blood vessels that are becoming the subclavian vessels, and this is where the auxiliary lymph nodes are. So that is where you'd be living, looking for auxiliary lymphadenopathy. And next is the internal thoracic nodes. The internal thoracic nodes as we first need to find the internal thoracic artery, which is there. And that's the other one. Those are the two internal thoracic arteries. And as you go down, you've got the, that's where the internal thoracic lymph nodes are. They're around that artery. Some even call them parasternal lymph nodes. Some in anatomical are called them parasternal lymph nodes. They're deep, they're next to the sternum, but they're deep, they're inside the rib cage. They're not outside. So they're non-palpable, but that's where they are. So those are your internal thoracic lymph nodes. Shall we keep going to the upper and lower paratracheal? Upper, lower paratracheal and retrotracheal for the layman is just paratracheal. That means that they're just paratracheal. Uh, but they can be divided uh, upper, lower and retro. Retro means behind. So all lymph nodes behind the trachea are retro. Um, and, and tracheal lymph nodes We'll start from the trachea, and so the trachea actually, like this is the thyroid cartilage. No, sorry, that's the thyroid gland, and so at the level of the cricoid, that's the that's the cricoid just under the thyroid gland. At the level of the cricoid, is where lower paratra uh, paratracheal begin, and above that are upper paratracheal. But lymph nodes around this area, around the trachea, oops, let me go upward, are paratracheal and you're looking around this area to find lymph nodes. And the ones behind, yep. Are you saying the cricoid? Yes. Yes. Upper and lower paratracheal, absolutely. 
but that's again that's a radiologist one and for radiologists I think it's not specific enough so just consider these paratracheal lymph nodes even the retro I just consider them as paratracheal lymph nodes so they're all around the trachea and they go all the way until the bifurcation of the trachea and then once the trachea bifurcates then below the trachea are carinal lymph nodes or some even call them subcarinal lymph nodes they're under the carina and then as you keep going lower down the midline they become this area become esophageal you get esophageal nodes here they're called esophageal nodes and they and esophageal nodes can be anywhere all the way until they get to the diaphragm and so we bring that back up from the esophageal nodes we'll come keep coming back up here until to the carina and then you've got the carinal nodes. Now the interesting thing with the carina is that, that you've got the carinal nodes, then from the carina you go to the hilum of the lung, and here are your hilar nodes right at the hilum of the lung. And, um, and then, the, then the nodes actually divide according to the bronchi. And so you've got um, interlobar nodes. Interlobar nodes are the, are the nodes between the lobes. So a, a better way to show it would actually be the sagittal section. So there's the trachea. The paratracheal nodes will be around it. That's the carina. So there's there you've got carinal nodes, the subcarinal nodes. Then there's the hilum. So you've got the hilar nodes there. And then you have interlobar nodes. So there's there's two interlobar nodes uh, on the right. One is between these. One is the upper lobe bronchus between the upper lobe bronchus and the bronchus intermedius. That's an interlobar. Uh, uh, um, lymph nodes that are there and then when you go further down you can't see that here but wh when the middle divides uh, when the middle lobe lobar bronchus exits um, and the lower uh, lobar bronchus comes through there is also um, the inferior lobar lymph nodal group there so there's a superior lymph nodal group an inferior lymph nodal group in the right in the left there's just one, which is between the right main upper and the and the right lower lobe bronchus. When those two divide at that area, just around this area, you have um, uh, interlobar uh, lymph node group in that in in the left lobe. Is that sort of clear? Yeah. Actually, uh, in between the lobar bronchi. So because in the left there's just two. Uh, bronchi, upper and lower, so in between them. And in the right, uh, it's between when the upper exits and the bronchi bronchus intermediate comes through, and then when the bronchus intermediate divides into middle and lower, that's where the other is. All right, that's fantastic. And then after the lobar um, uh, 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 lymph nodes, you have segmental and sub-segmental lymph nodes. So um, as you went through the segments, now it's going to be um, you won't be able to see it too well here because I've got let's just maybe go into the pulmonary window when we went into the segments then the, every segment has its own lymph node groups and then the subsegmental area also has the lymph, lymph node groups so throughout the bronchial tree there are lymph nodes so they're paratracheal then they're carinal then they're lobar then they're interlobar sorry then they're hyler Hyler can actually also be called lobar. Hyler, and then they're interlobar, and then they're segmental, and then they're subsegmental. And so throughout their lymph nodes. So these bright things can actually be lymph nodes. I know they're pulmonary vessels, but you can follow them through in a lot of a lot of time. But lymph nodes around these areas, especially if they're enlarged because of malignancies, show up bright just like this. And and they could be anywhere along the segment. And those are, you know, the su segmental and subsegmental lymph nodes. All righty. And then we've got the preaortic or prevascular group. Now the prevascular group of lymph nodes. Here we are near the diaphragm. That's the heart coming up. The well, it's not down here actually. It's slightly higher up. But when the great vessels sort of begin to emerge, there's a lymph node group here. And, and so the lymph node groups here, and those are prevascular lymph nodes. They can even be here. They're in front of the aorta, in front of the pulmonary trunk. They can be laterally, but these are the prevascular or pre lymph node groups. 
the periaortic lymph node group you have to move slightly higher up where am I yes and they are around the arch of the aorta they're the periaortic lymph node groups and as you go down they sort of divide around the aorta so they can be periaortic lymph node groups are here Yes, yes, there, there is a difference. The abdominal periaortic lymph nodes are actually um, far larger, far more, because the periaortic lymph nodes in the abdominal drain the whole lower limb and the, and the abdominal contents also. So yes, there's that, there's, they're around the same area. If you're saying that they are they around the aorta, yes, they are around the aorta, uh, but they're, they're a different lymph node group. And they just work for yes, now these are, th these are thoracic, those are abdominal. Yep. And then there's a subaortic lymph node group, which is between the arch of the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. So it'll be above here. It'll be above this area and below this area. And so it'll be right in that plane. And that is a subaortic. Uh, sorry, that is the, uh, uh, what you call the, oh yeah, the, the, that is a subaortic lymph node group, uh, which also some call aortopulmonary group also. They call the aorta pulmonary windows in that area. So um, they can be called the subaortic group or the AP group. All right. And after that, as I'm, then I've got these periesophageal group. And I mentioned that, that as the carina ends, the, the lymph nodes over here become the periesophageal lymph nodes. And they keep going down. And when they get further, quite further down around this area, then you've got the cardiophrenic lymph node group which is basically around the inferior pericardium, all around it, and on the diaphragm. So this area also has lymph node groups, and they're called the cardiophrenic lymph node groups. And that concludes today's demonstration. I'll stop. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel and follow my Facebook page. Please also support my work on Patreon and Kickstarter. It will be greatly appreciated.